Hi there, Matthew Guzdal here again with another lecture out of the Game AI course at the University of Alberta. Today, we'll be talking about state-of-the-art automated game playing and why it won't be in any games anytime soon. Uh, that's a bit of a wordy title, though, so let's just call it Deep Reinforcement Learning instead. Now, notably, uh, this is going to be probably a longer lecture again. I don't know exactly how long because Matthew in the current time doesn't know yet. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, let's just get going and we'll, we'll see how long this takes. Okay, so as per the usual, here's some survey links. If you're in the class, you're going to need to take this survey. And that seems like enough time. Hopefully I'm in the chat and I've just posted the link already. If I've not, uh, somebody, you know, look into my whereabouts. <laughs> All right. Okay, so situating this lecture. So at the beginning of the semester, I told you there were three major branches of game AI. Uh, for those of you who are not here at the beginning of the semester, uh, those were triple AI, which were the big budget, big indie games. It's sort of the equivalent of like a Hollywood blockbuster in the game world. Indie, which are smaller games made by smaller teams that are independent of these big AAA developers. And then academic game AI. So as of the last lecture, we are well within the realm of academic game AI, besides the occasional cool weird stuff, which we'll talk a little bit more about on Friday. So let's start by talking about how many of you are probably familiar with automated game playing, which is when automated game playing shows up in news articles. So there have been a number of recent examples. Um, I obviously just used an example from the Lee Sedol versus AlphaGo match, uh, championship Go match. Then there more recently, there's been things like Dario TLO Wunsch versus AlphaStar, uh, which was from Google. Uh, OG versus OpenAI 5 uh, in Dota 2, and, uh, oh, this is StarCraft 2, I should say. And then just today, uh, 12 hours ago as of time of recording, uh, DeepMind just announced Agent 57, which is an AI agent, uh, which uses the approaches that we'll talk about today, which is able to uh, beat out all the human baselines for all of these Atari games, 57 Atari games. Uh, which is again from Google. So you'll see three, three, three of the four of these are Google. So um, you might ask yourself, okay, well, what was the technology behind this? This sounds like incredible stuff. It's beating humans at these games. It's playing games that AI has never been able to play before uh, to the same you know level as a human. Uh, and they're all deep reinforcement learning. It's the primary technology going on here. So what is deep reinforcement learning then? Okay, well, it is reinforcement learning that uses deep neural networks to learn the policy. Uh, so deep neural networks, we talked about a little bit yesterday or on Monday, uh, what is time to give you a little bit of an intuition about that. So the big question is what's reinforcement learning? But before then, <laughs> policy, the policy is basically what actions to take when. So essentially, what are the correct times, when, when is the correct place in the game to take what actions? Now, obviously, this is an incredible approach that has led to leaps and bounds in performance on game playing and robotics tasks. Um, if you look at like real world uh, autonomous drivers, so AI driven cars, that's also going to be a lot of deep reinforcement learning going on there. But again, it will not be showing up in a game, in a, a developed game that you will be able to buy anytime soon. So question, what is reinforcement learning? That, that's sort of what we're going to need to talk about now. I am aware of the fact that I am lecturing, well, not physically, uh, but I am lecturing from the University of Alberta, which is a you know world leader in reinforcement learning. That's like their bread and butter. Uh, and I don't do reinforcement learning research. So I'm not going to uh, go in as depth in this lecture as some other people would. But we are going to have to start a little bit before we can talk about reinforcement learning. We're going to talk about the one-armed bandit problem. This is a standard way of introducing reinforcement learning. So a one-armed bandit, if you're not familiar, is a slot machine, right? Uh, you pull this lever, this one right here, and these slots uh, all go uh, twirling around, and then you try to pull the lever so they line up, and when they line up, uh, you get some payout, right? That's the idea, at least. So under the hood, we can assume that a one-armed bandit, and now I'm using this image, which is definitely not a stock photo uh, that you can definitely see from the watermarks, um, uh, has some unknown true probability of giving us a jackpot, okay? 
We don't know the exact probability of the jackpot, but we know that there is one in this machine. Now it's probably extremely, extremely low. Um, but if we played it an infinite number of times, we could figure out what the probability of the jackpot was, or at least we'd have a good estimate, right? We could count the number of times we won over as the, our times we've tried goes to infinity, and then just divide that by our total attempts. And that would give us the probability of the jackpot, right? Now, this is not a way that I recommend anyone gamble. I, in fact, I don't recommend anyone gamble, but that's besides the point. Uh, but it, it is a way we could theoretically do this if we could just try infinitely long. Okay, so that's how we could solve the one-armed bandit problem. What about a multi-armed bandit problem? So now we assume we have three of these machines, three of these one-armed bandits, so therefore multi-armed bandit. So we have lots of choices. So each of these machines has some probability of a payout. So it's our job to try to figure out which of these machines should we be you know, uh, betting on? Which of these machines should we be using? Uh, it's going to cost us a little bit every single time. So we don't want to just, you know, choose all of them and have them, uh, you know, uh, run forever, right? Uh, try an infinite number of times on each of these machines. We want to be able to figure out the best machine to be able to pick, right? Uh, to be able to do our gambling that we shouldn't do. So we've got some options here. Um, we can't just keep playing one bandit to figure out its potential for reward money, right? We couldn't just play this one for infinity, this one for infinity, and this one for infinity. That's not how infinity works. We want to maximize our reward across all the bandits, right? So figure out, uh, you know, given some initial start state where we don't know anything, figure out which of these we should be, we should be pulling from. So we need to do some trade-off of making money with current knowledge and gaining new knowledge, right? Uh, so as we're, we're testing, we can test uh, these different machines to see, uh, update our, our approximation, what we think their probability of a payout is. Um, and, but we want to trade that off with also making money using whatever our current best estimate of which machine gives us the best probability of a payout. So this is called exploitation versus exploration. Exploitation is taking advantage of whatever we think is the state of the world right now. And exploration is testing things out, trying new things. So we have to balance between these two things. So if we just did exploitation, right, we would basically be doing a greedy strategy where we always pick the machine we think will give us the best reward. Now, as a reminder, the machines give rewards according to some probability. So let's say that we had this gray machine, which had a, an actual payout of 50%. 50% of the time it gave us a jackpot. Obviously, uh, no actual machine would do that. This is just an example. Then this orange-ish machine, I don't know, maybe it's a red or a brown, who can tell, um, was actually, would give us like a 25% payout. And this blue machine would give us a 10% payout. So let's say we uh, uh, happen to at first, because we don't know anything yet, pick the gray machine and we lost. Okay, so we're gonna assume that our gray machine, oh, this isn't quite right, but um, let's assume our gray machine gives a payout never, right? Okay, so then we get our orange machine and that gives us a win. Uh, and so we assume that it, right now, it always is going to give us a win. Uh, and then the blue machine, we try that one. Uh, and because we didn't know anything about it, and that one also gives us zero. That gives us no nothing. And so we assume that never is going to give us anything. So now we're going to get stuck trying the orange machine forever, right? Because we've gotten to this position, we're just by chance, because by random chance, the orange machine happened to give us a payout. We're going to try it forever, even though it's not the best machine to be using. Uh, let me fix these slides real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. So this would be the... Uh, this would be the gray. So let's just do G, G for gray. This is the orange machine and this is the blue machine. For some reason, I put them in the opposite order, which is fine. Let's fix it on this slide too. Okay, so then if we just did exploration, so we, if we always pick a random machine, no matter what we believe, then we would just you know pick at random and, and we would have no way of ensuring that we would keep picking the gray machine even when we thought, according to our beliefs, it was the best option. But it would allow us to get out of that issue that we had earlier of always assuming that the orange machine was the best, right? It's just that even if we updated our belief, we couldn't do anything about it because we always are going to be exploring, always going to just be picking a random machine, okay? Okay, so uh, a very simple sort of strategy for trying to get out of this situation that combines exploitation and exploration is called epsilon greedy. Uh, 
In epsilon greedy, we pick some epsilon. And epsilon tells us the probability of taking a random action. So an epsilon value of 0.1 says 10% of the time we're gonna take a random action, 90% of the time we're gonna try the best machine according to our current beliefs. We can have a different you know, value of epsilon, it depends on the domain, what actually makes the most sense, but this allows us to do a trade-off of exploration and exploitation. So we can escape from our early greedy mistakes. It might take a while because we have to rely on random actions, but eventually we would be able to do it, again, as our attempts go to infinity. So uh, at this point, I want to introduce the concept of regret. Regret is uh, if we imagine a perfect agent who always takes the best action, right? Whatever action would give it the best reward, the most reward. Uh, then we can compare that agent's payout with our agent's payout for each action to get the regret for that step. Uh, basically, how far off were we from the best thing we could do? Summing up the regret across all the time steps, all of our attempts in our, in our world gives us the total regret. So maximizing our total reward can be thought of as equivalent to minimizing this total regret. So here's an example of a domain. The exact setup of the domain doesn't matter, um, but we have our time steps here. We have our total regret um, at that particular time step here. Here's the greedy uh, approach, right? The greedy approach is going to have a linear regret because once we get, once we you know come up with something that we think is good, we're just going to keep doing it forever. So here's where our our greedy linear position would get us. Now again, uh, higher is worse here. Now epsilon greedy, if we're just assuming that we have like a 0.1 check, that's going to give us an, again a linear. Um, uh, a linear relationship here, but it's going to be one that's going to be lower than greedy, right? We're guaranteed to not have as much regret as greedy because we're not locked into one strategy. Uh, now, obviously, if we happen upon the best strategy at first with our greedy method, then we'll you know do that forever. And then we have decaying epsilon greedy. So this is an interesting idea where instead of having a fixed epsilon, we decay our epsilon according to some uh, you know schedule. And if we do that, we can have a, not a, a linear relationship at all, but more of a, uh, you know, a long curve, um, which is going to flatten out eventually. So decaying epsilon greedy is we're going to drop our epsilon lower and lower according to some schedule. Uh, we got some logarithmic asymptotic, uh, if I can speak, asymptotic regret. And the downside, though, is that we need to have enough domain knowledge to come up with a good schedule beforehand. So this is just an example of sort of ways that you can uh, try to cheat the system, right, to get a little bit better. Okay, so at this point you might be saying, Matthew, what does this have to do with games? Sorry for that bad impression of you. So we can imagine mapping this onto a video game domain, where each machine is now a distinct action. And a reward could be something like not dying, or getting to the end of the level, or things like that, right? So in a particular moment of the game, we can think of any actions, the set of actions the players can do as a set of machines. And we're trying to figure out the best machine to pick, right? It's basically the same situation. It's just that instead of the lever of machine, maybe it's, you know, an A button for jumping. Instead of this lever of this machine, maybe it's the right arrow, et cetera, et cetera. But we're trying to figure out how to maximize our reward. Notably, though, the values are probably going to differ based on the context. So. The value of going left or right will be different if there's an enemy on the left or the right, right? So it's not just the case that we can think about, we need to figure out, you know, this, this sort of what machine is best, what action is best for any situation. It's dependent on what situation we're in, we'll say, we'll determine what's the best action that we can take. So we separate out these different situations we could be in by uh, referring to them as states, different states that our agent, our, our player, could be in. Um, now this comes down to the notion of a Markov decision process. Our multi-arm bandit that we were talking about so far could be thought of as a single state or stateless Markov decision process. But we are interested, for games, uh, in uh, not in multiple states, uh, Markov decision processes with multiple states. Now this is our, uh, our, our lord and savior, Andrei Markov, a uh, really clever dude. Uh, he came up with this notion. We'll talk about that more in just a second. All right, so in games, and in most cases we care about, like robotics, autonomous cars, there's more than one state, right? The world is constantly changing, and so we need to take different actions depending on the state of the world. So a Markov decision process is a way of formulating certain kinds of problems, right? Um, to be able to figure out what the best thing to do, right, in this particular problem. 
So let's talk about this particular problem setup. It's a particular representation for how we, we do problems. Uh, so S is going to be some finite set of states, right? Um, notably, this has to be finite for it to be a Markovian decision process. Now you'll note that in the real world, say, uh, states are not finite. But you do some hacks and you can get around that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, a is uh, our finite set of actions. Again, same problem. If we're talking about the real world, um, I could move my arm or my mouse uh, a little bit this way, right? This mouse movement is continuous. I can move it anywhere on the screen. And that might seem like it's infinite. But what if instead we said, you know, every pixel position of this screen was, you know, uh, a state and the movement between pixels is an action. Now that would be a lot of actions and a lot of states but it would be finite. Then we have a transition uh, uh, function. This tells us the probability that action A is going to take us from state S to state S1. Uh, so really, uh, this should be like that. There we go. Ba -ba -ba. Uh, then we have our reward. So this is the reward from transitioning from some state S to some state S1, so two different states. And then we have a gamma, which is a discount factor, which demonstrates the difference in importance between future. Uh, that should be, again, what the heck was I doing when I put these slides together? That's the question. Uh, between future rewards and present rewards. All right. Uh, OK, so this is basically how much we care about things in the future versus what's happening right now. So the high level idea here is if the multi arm bandit problem was a single state MDP, we can think of learning a strategy to play a game as solving this problem, this multi arm bandit problem for every state of the game. Uh, so notably though, uh, states also have particular requirements. The state representation has to be Markovian and a state representation is Markovian if it has all the information we need to make an optimal decision. So let's think about some examples. There's lots of ways you could do this. Let's talk about Super Mario Brothers again, because you know who doesn't like talking about Super Mario Brothers? And also, I introduced it in the last lecture, so I feel like it's it's valid to talk about. So what we could do, say, is for a state representation, figuring out the optimal thing to do would be to do uh, what pixels are present on the screen at this time, right? So that would mean that our our set of states would be every single possible screen value when we're playing this game. This is a massive space. Let's say, let's be nice and say this was a 32 by 32 uh, pixel image. It isn't, it's bigger than that. But then for each pixel, we have a red value, which can be between zero and 255, a green value, which can be between zero and 255, and a blue value that can be between zero and 255, which is 16 trillion, nearly 17 trillion states. That is so many states. That's way too many states, right? No way could we learn to play the game this way. No way could we visit every single state possible. Now, notably, this is a little bit of an over-exaggeration because not every single pixel value can possibly show up in Super Mario Brothers, but still, uh, it's a really, really big state space. So, what? okay, let's cut it down. What if we did a grid representation where instead we're going to segment all our locations into tiles and then all enemies could maybe be represented as just a single enemy type like we did for our PCGML examples. So, uh, and then there's a question of, okay, how much love the level to include in the state? Is it just the screen, smaller, larger? So let's say we did a nine by 15 tile grid where we had 14 possible things that could be in each tile. Okay, well that's 1,890 states. That seems much more reasonable. Now there's a question of, is this Markovian or not, right? Because notably Mario takes continuous actions and it really matters if Mario is here or if Mario is a little bit more to the right, if there's an enemy right here. So this might not be Markovian. This might not satisfy our, our condition here. Um, but it's certainly way, way smaller. So it's a step in the right direction. The last thing we could do is instead list have a list of facts as our state. So there would be things like you have an enemy to your right at maybe some distance. You have a power up above. You have your fire Mara, your arm on the ground, etc. cetera. Um, and the state space here would be variable depending on the number of facts that we have and how many parameters each fact have. But at minimum, right, right now, this is one, two, three, four, let's call it five or six facts, uh, which is if, okay, if these can be on or not, then that's what, two to the six, which is a very small state space. It's very, very reasonable. 
This might seem a little bit weird, but I'll give you an actual in real world example of people using this kind of state representation uh, and show you where you can come up. Now, notably, you can also mix and match these state representations. So we could have a grid, but then also have some information appended here at the end about like, oh, hey, you're Fire Mario, by the way. Sorry if you can hear my cat. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, there's some trade-offs here with state representation. The more complex the state, uh, that can ensure that we have an agent that has all the information they could possibly need, right? We're ensuring that the state space is Markovian. But the less complex the state representation is, it'll speed up training because there's more states that look the same, that are, are essentially the same state. There's fewer states to worry about, but make it too simple and it's no longer Markovian. So the goal is to find some middle ground for, for any environment that we're going to apply an MDP to. We want the simplest state representation that still allows for optimal performance. Okay, so that brings us to our first question, 21 minutes in. Sorry, again, this is going to be a long one. I apologize. Here's the question. What state representations would you use for the following and why? First, tic-tac-toe. Second, a simple platformer. And third, a real-time strategy game like Civilization or StarCraft. Now, notably, uh, hopefully everybody knows Tic-Tac-Toe. You can think of Mario for a simple platformer. For a real-time strategy game, this one's a little bit weird. You might have a map of variable size, units all over the place, and notably, you have Fog of War as well. Uh, okay, so give that some thought, uh, write down an answer, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, that seems like enough time. A uh, little peek behind the curtain here. What I did was I just fed my cats so that hopefully they wouldn't keep screaming and you'd hear them on the uh, recording. Okay, so here are my answers. For Tic-Tac-Doe, uh, this is a small enough stage base that you could have just the game board, right? So we have nine positions, three by three, and we have three things that can go in each position, which means uh, nine to the third power. It's fairly small. That's, that's small enough that we could you know, reasonably visit every single state. 
and visit every single state multiple times in order to do this kind of estimation. We talked about having to, you know, uh, for every one of the multi-armed bandit problems, which again, we have to now solve for every state, we talked about having to check infinite times every single action you could take. Now, for tic-tac-toe, thankfully, their set of actions and our set of states are small enough that we could really just check everything, uh, you know, uh, enough times that we could figure things out. For a simple platformer, uh, what I would say is let's do a grid of screen width and height with values for collidable elements, breakable elements, empty spaces, and enemy types, flying, etc. So basically, the middle example that I gave you served for Super Mario Brothers. There's a question of whether that was Markovian or not, so maybe we need a little bit more detail here, like something like um, your distance to your closest enemy or something, as one other feature, one other thing in this state representation. And then for a real-time strategy game, um, I would say, okay, let's try the world map, uh, the little, little tiny one that tends to occur on the bottom left corner, so like a way zoomed down representation of the world, plus a list of facts about currently uh, running commands, things like building troops, moving troops, upgrading buildings, etc. Okay, but how do we know what's best to do in each state? I haven't told you that yet. I've told you about states. I've told you about doing this Markov decision process, this, this MDP, finding the, the best you know, lever to pull in each state by just trying things infinitely. Uh, but that doesn't seem like an actually decent strategy to take. Hey, now hold on. Uh, earlier in the lecture, I mentioned something called a policy, which basically tells us what actions to take when. So let me define that a little bit more. A policy is what action to take in any given state uh, pi, I don't know why we use pi for policy, it's just a thing. Uh, uh, pi of a given state, so it's a lookup table at a given state that tells us what action do we take that's the best action to take, or rather, the action to take according to that policy. We'll get to best in a minute. Uh, the action to take according to this policy at this state, right? So it's a big table of all the state's values uh, are the keys, and the values are the actions to take at that state. The purpose of reinforcement learning of any reinforcement learning algorithm is to approximate an optimal policy, the best policy, right? Which isn't to say that all policies are equally good, uh, but it's the best policy, the, pol the policy that's gonna give us the best action to take for every state according to whatever our reward function is. So let's, let's think of an example. Let's put this into a context. So here's our grid world. Uh, reinforcement learning people love grid worlds. That's a great way, a simple way of showing an MDP. So here's our, our situation. For our set of states, each cell is gonna be a state, okay? Our actions are up, down, left, or right. For our transition function, we're gonna assume that actions always succeed, no problem. For reward, our reward for transitioning into the blue state is a plus one, into the red state, uh, either of the red states is a minus one, okay? And this is a wall, so we can't go there at all. Okay, so here are two policies. According to this policy, in this position, we would go up or right, we could go up, up, up in this one. Uh, in these positions, we would go left. In these positions, we would go down. In these positions, we would all go right. Uh, in these positions, we would go left or down. So uh, hopefully this is clear. This policy would have us go towards the red states as quickly as possible, right? So it's a, it's a lookup table. In fact, it's the same sort of table representation as this grid world, but if this grid world was... You know, instead, if we did the, the, this fact-based representation or something, then their keys would be this you know, unique set of facts for each state. But in this case, nicely, each cell is a state, so in each cell, we have an action. Okay, so here's our second policy. In this one, we basically always go up right until we get to this sort of area, then we go up. Uh, if we get to here, we go down. So this one is closer to what we think of as the optimal policy, the policy that we should be doing to be able to maximize our reward. Okay, so policies can be good, policies can be bad. Our goal is to go from an initially random policy, initially not very good policy, to a better policy. Okay, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, but the basic idea is that we're going to iteratively act in our environment. So this is like the standard reinforcement learning figure people show. You have an agent. That agent takes actions in an environment. That action, that that environment, then. Uh, it tells us the reward we just got for taking that action and the state that we are now in, right, uh, after taking that. And then we take another action and then we iterate, 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 iterate. We pay attention to the reward we're getting by taking these actions and we use that to update our policy. Well, not directly. We're going to update a, a second representation and then get the policy out of that. But again, there's lots of reinforcement learning approaches to do this. But I'm just going to talk about one. And that's a Q, the Q learning algorithm. Um, 
I'm going to call this the most general reinforcement learning approach. Some people might argue with me there, but it's by far the most popular one. So here's the pseudocode. What we're going to do is we're going to assign a table, not just of the state values as our keys, but state action pairs as our keys. And uh, we're going to assign that arbitrary with arbitrary values initially. Values meaning numbers, right? Then we're going to observe our current state S, whatever state we're starting in. And then we're going to repeat the following. First, select and carry out an action A. Observe the reward that we got for doing that in our new state as prime. Then we're going to do this long update function where uh, we take whatever our value is currently at uh, this position, whatever value we think this particular state and action pair was worth, and we add this alpha. This is a, um, a learning rate. This says how quickly we can make a change to these values. The current reward we just got the gamma, which tells us how much do we care about future things, and then the maximum that we can get for this uh, 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 from going from uh, this, this next state to our current state, right? So the best thing that we could possibly get if we kept going from this, uh, this next state minus the best thing we could get in this current state, okay? Long update thing. Uh, now, notably, if we set our gamma to zero, so we don't care about the future at all, then we're only going to be updating this based on the reward, right? Pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you just repeat this until termination. This termination condition could be some number of steps. It could be when our Q table is, you know, not changing so much anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's do an example. Uh, this one's gonna gonna be a little bit more. So it's a lot of details here. So let's. Let's try to get this up, you know, roll up my sleeves. Okay, so same example world, but a couple more things. We have a gamma value of one and an alpha value, I know this is an A, let's all just pretend, an alpha value of 0.1, okay? What this means is we are going to care about our, our future as much as possible, and we are going to, boop, 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 um, uh, we are going to care, uh, we're going to uh, uh, cha allow changes in this this learning rate, uh, 0 0.1. I actually don't think I do that. I think I did an alpha rate of 1. Regardless, uh, we can go ahead and run this. So we have initialized Q table, which is all values of 0, okay? Now, typically, you would actually set these to random values in a range, but the math is a lot easier with zeros. So first of all, we're going to do some rollout. So I went right in the state, I went up in the state, I went right in the state, I went down in the state, I went right in the state. Okay, so then we need to update according to this this thing. So um, in this position, our reward for going to this next state was negative one. Everything else was all zeros, so this is just negative one. Okay, in this state, we didn't get any reward for transitioning into this state, but uh, and it was all zeros at the time. But uh, we get a uh, uh, we have this negative one reward that we're sort of percolating backwards and are per percolating backwards according to this learning rate. Um, Oh, actually, it should be according to this y value. I did do one. Okay, these should be flopped. Uh, let's all just pretend these were flipped. So this is negative 0 0.1. This is negative 0 0.01. This is negative 0 0.001. This is negative 0 0.0001, right? So we can see this, this negative word percolating backwards through this table. Okay, so then let's do another rollout. Uh, so in this rollout, we happen to go up, up, right, 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 down, right, down, right? Uh, not another right. So again, these, these rollouts are just random. Maybe we're doing it according to some epsilon greedy thing where we're trying to maximize you know, our, our current information plus doing a little bit of exploration. It doesn't really matter. Regardless, we do a rollout. So then we again, we again ended up in this you know, negative one position. So I'm gonna again update our values like this. Then we do another rollout. In this rollout, I happen to go down 100 times in a row just by chance. Now in this case, uh, we never got any reward. And so this <laughs> doesn't have any update. Right? No change whatsoever. Now roll out four, we finally managed to get into that plus one state. So we percolate the reward backwards, same exact thing. And then eventually our table might look something like this. These are not exact values, these are all just approximated, but over enough times we'll eventually get in a position like this. Now there's a question. How do we figure out the optimal policy from this Q table? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to get this out, this policy from this Q table by finding the action uh, A for each state S. All right, cats. Uh, they haven't been like this for any of the other recordings. Why tonight? They just love reinforcement learning. 
uh, by finding action A for each state S that maximizes uh, this, this value, right? Uh, so in other words, we're gonna grab these actions at each of these states. So our, uh, uh, our final policy looks like this. Ups all along here, rights all along here, ups along here, downs along here, okay? Now, notably, with this final policy, there are states that we're just never going to get to. But if by some random chance, say that this transition function, for example, didn't always have our actions succeed, if we ended up in one of these states, we'd still be okay because we'd still know the right thing to do because we just iterated through enough time, we explored enough states. Okay, that leads us to question two. Given all of this, what are some pros and cons of Q learning that you can think of right now? Take a couple minutes, write something down, at least think about it, and we'll talk about it. Okay, that feels like enough time. So Q learning, pros and cons. Here's what I came up with. Pros, we don't need to have a forward model, okay? So compared to all other decision-making approaches we've had talked about so far, it, like planning, for example, or, or path planning, all these things, we had to have some forward model that told us, given our current state and our current action, where do we go next? Instead, we just go in blind, right? We can just go ahead and take actions at random. If they don't work, they don't work. And then eventually we'll be able to figure out, you know, uh, some correct set of actions. And it means we can go into any environment blind, right? Uh, I, I don't need to have some specialized information about this environment. I don't need to have a heuristic about this environment. I don't need to have, I don't know, a finite statement tree, a behavior tree about this environment. And I can go into this environment and eventually learn how to act in this particular environment, in this particular set of states, in this particular world. Okay, cons in comparison. It takes up tons of memory, depending on our size of our state uh, set and our size of our action set. And it takes a very long time to converge, again, depending on our state set and our action set. Okay, so given this, imagine the size of the Q tables. If we're just using a dictionary for our Q tables or a hash map, right? Uh, something where you can put in a key, some set of keys and get out a value for games like Go or StarCraft or Dota or Dota 2 rather, right? So if we were using uh, the, that standard approach or just a dictionary, uh, the last time I looked it up, uh, the early, the best approximations we can have for the number of, of states in Go is you know, uh, more than there are atoms in the universe. So there's no possible way that a computer could represent all the states of any of these games. There's way too many states. And, you know, no way we could visit them all enough times then. So what do we do? Well, notably, none of these are actually using the screen states or human player actions. So um, this blog post by OpenAI actually does a really good job of breaking this down. But for actions, what they do over here on the left is they actually break down a few different kinds of uh, actions that you might have. And they basically broken down, this is for Dota 2, uh, the kinds of things that you might care about in terms of uh, the kinds of actions you might be doing. So what is your target? 
what is from a finite set of actions, what are your finite set of actions you can do? From an offset, right, an offset off the target. These are not continuous things, right? We've binned these into negative 400, negative 300, negative 200, negative 100, et cetera, right? And how long off are we again from taking this action? Do we do it instantly, a little bit of a delay, a longer delay, a longer delay, right? So uh, notably what this means is that none of these agents that we've been talking about are playing these games like a human plays these games. They're all in some smaller space. None of them are using a mouse and a keyboard, right? Um, they're all using this sort of higher, higher well-designed space that an expert had to come up with. Same thing with states, right? So here's the state of the game. We have some observed units. We have the team that we're on. We have our health, our attack, our armor, and our distance. That's it. So this is a lot closer to that fact-based representation for state. You can see it basically these lines are the things that we care about for the states, the lines and the circles in this image. Um, then we are like anything to do with the screen. So again, not playing this game like a human does, not looking at things like this, right? So there's a lot of this that we've crunched down on and made a lot smaller. But even still, these are massive action states and massive state, uh, sorry, action sets and state sets, right? If it's just one, one of each of these things, that's still, you know, a massive space. If it's one of each of these things, that's still a massive space. But here's an intuition. Some of these states are going to be very similar especially in this kind of representation, right? Where, you know, health of, uh, you know, 875 and 874, probably basically the same thing, right? But if we're just using a dictionary, we have to have each of those be a unique key. So what if we could learn what states were similar such that we could know to use similar actions in similar states? Here's the intuition. How are we going to do it? Well, Here's a hint. We know we have infinite training data because I've been talking about infinitely trying things over and over again. Since we're using an environment that we can just query a number of times, right? We can even run things in parallel so that we can, you know, query things, I don't know, more time for more time than the human civilization has existed. Just as a crazy example that definitely isn't an actual example of one of these things. Well, what approach can do well with lots of training data? That's right, I've been leaning here this whole time. It's deep re or deep uh, neural networks, which is how we get to deep reinforcement learning. So basically, here's our standard reinforcement learning setup, right? All we're going to do is replace our agent with a deep neural network. What this functionally is going to do is, instead of querying in on a specific key, right, a uh, specific state and a specific action, instead we're passing this through our neural network, which is going to tell us what to do next, right? What's the value of what's the next best thing to do? Or if we're you know, doing some exploration, then you know, here are the, my values, and you just pick it random according to this. What this lets us do functionally, though, is it lets us figure out what states are similar, because we're not just querying into a dictionary, we're querying into a neural network. OK, so uh, I'm going to do a Unity ML example, but I want to uh, uh, minimize your expectations here. I'm going to use the Unity ML agent setup. And I'm not going to show you code because they don't give any code. Uh, and we're not going to do a lot of things here, uh, primarily because my poor laptop wouldn't be able to take it. OK. OK, so here we are in the Unity ML environment. Uh, this is a ML agent setup that Unity has created on their own uh, through their machine learning research group. And it's basically a lot of simple examples of using deep reinforcement learning. Uh, so notably, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to play this, and it's going to play this little game where this little fellow uh, is moving around on little spindly legs uh, and trying to find these little uh, cubes, trying to, to make make it his way downtown or make its way downtown to these cubes, getting as many as they can. Now, notably, there's multiple of these occurring simultaneously. So we can look at specific positions and say, OK, so there's that one going over here. There's this one going, etc. So lots of these little spiders. Uh, running around, or no, no, they only got four legs, so I don't know, uh, you know, some kind of animal that has weird four legs, uh, rocking around trying to find these little things. So this is the simplest thing you could imagine wanting to throw into a game, right? An agent that is able to move to a location consistently, right? Move to some goal location that we give it. Okay, so this is pre-trained, right? This is something where it has all the information it could possibly want. It's, it's trained for a very long time to be able to find an optimal policy. Still looks a little silly, but you know, uh, uh, it gets it there. 
Okay. Now we can already hear my, my, my poor laptop's fans going. Uh, okay, now we're going to train it from scratch. Okay. Here is our little agent. Here's another one over here. We can see all of our little agents. And look at them trying to find the cube. Notably, uh, they're running in parallel, so they're all running the same uh, actual deep Q network, uh, the same deep reinforcement learning. So they can all basically learn from each other because they they all have one brain. Uh, we can think of it that way, even though, again, uh, neural networks are not brains. But we can see uh, not a lot of progress being made. This is a really hard problem, right? It's very hard to figure out what you should do, even though to us, oh no. All right, I think this is about as long as we can go. My poor laptop's not going to be able to take much more of this. But hopefully, as the fans of my laptop get louder and louder, you can see how long and how hard it is, as my poor laptop works very, very hard, to be able to learn a policy like that. Okay, uh, so hopefully that visceral example of how tough it is to train a deep reinforcement learning approach, even for a very, very simple problem, uh, it can give you a sense of just how long that these things take, at least an intuition, which is all that I'm really here for. Okay, so deep Q learning. Let's let's think about this a little bit. So it, it uses a deep neural network as the Q table. It's going to be training to correctly predict the value of the state and action pairs. Now, it led to huge improvements. Oh, that's the wrong lead. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Da, 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 da. Let's change that to there. There we go. I've never made a spelling mistake in my life. Uh, led to huge improvements in automatic game playing and robot control tasks. But again, it's still not going to be used in any game anytime soon. Now, just from that, you might have an intuition as to why, but let's talk about it. Now, maybe instead what you're saying is, Matthew, why would you say that? This sounds awesome. Well, lots of reasons. First off, it's incredibly time consuming. OpenAI 5 to be able to play Dota 2 at a human level, human expert level, trained for longer than the human civilization has existed. Now, how could they do that? Well, they had a massive amount of compute and they were training lots and lots of instances of the same agent in parallel, right? Just like you saw there where we had lots of agents running around in parallel and they all had the same brain. Same thing going on here. So in terms of the computation time, they had longer than the human civilization has existed just so they could learn to play Dota, right? That's a massive amount of time. Uh, resource intensive. So obviously you see above, you need massive amounts of compute, but you also need the knowledge of how to apply these approaches, right? And this is very specific of, of knowing how to do these things. Quirky. So uh, AI isn't going to play like people expect, right? Uh, notably in OpenAI 5 case, uh, they would spam useless items constantly because it wasn't bad or good to do it. It was just sort of equally good or bad to do it. And so therefore, why not just keep doing it over and over again? Uh, they don't play like people do, which is bad when we're talking about game AI because we're trying to convince our players that this you know, enemy or this animal in the background or this big boss or whatever is a, a, th a thing, a specific thing, right? We don't want human guards to be running around like that little spider robot was just jerking back and forth constantly. No, no good. Uh, and they're brittle, so the AI is going to break if it sees something it never saw before. In, in OpenAI 5's case, they did a one-on-one -on -one, um, example where when they first had you know human experts going up against it, uh, the human experts were losing, but then the human experts found one weird item that the AI had never seen before and were immediately able to break it. Just had a very simple strategy for, for beating the AI. So that's not great. And last but not least, uh, fun. Players want, we talked about this way earlier, but players want fun enemies, not optimal ones. You might think to yourself, oh, no, 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 not me. I, I'm a Dark Souls elite epic pro gamer. Uh, well, even in the case of Dark Souls, there's all kinds of animation tricks so that you can learn to outwit the enemy. The fun thing is outwitting them. If you were actually playing up against an optimal opponent, you would never win. Never, ever, ever would you win. And so that's just not fun to play against. Okay, so the other thing going on here is it's actually been tried before. So Jesse Clough, 
here's right here, uh, gave a talk at Marlowe 2018, this workshop. Uh, he was an AEI, E-A-A-I lead, ooh, lots of letters, uh, for Gears of War. And he gave a long talk talking about them trying to use deep reinforcement learning. But these are the, this is the most important slide I found. So in terms of a replacement technology to the things they're using right now, which again are things like behavior trees, right? Who we talked about earlier in the semester. Uh, the things that matter for, in terms of replacing their current technology are that it has to be cheaper. It's definitely not that. Faster, it's definitely not that. Simpler, it has to be definitely not that. More reliable, definitely not that. Better results, maybe, right? Again, depending on how we set up these results. So that's lots of reasons why AAA is just not going to use deep reinforcement learning anytime soon. There's also the game development loop to consider. So we talked about this a little bit with PCGML, but let's talk about it here. So the way that things typically work is that we're going to create some prototype game that has some prototype AI, something very simple, just so that we can test out the concepts of the game. From there, we're going to play our initial prototype, realize the game needs tweaking because it's a prototype and we need to make some changes, tweak our game, right? Make some changes to, to how the game's working right now, Tweak our agents, which if we're using a behavior tree or an FSM, is maybe changing a parameter or two. That's that's all it really takes. Maybe we write a whole new function if we're we're you know really going out there. Play the game again, realize the game needs tweaking, etc. Right? We follow this iterative loop over and over and over again until we're satisfied enough with the game or we've pushed back our deadline enough times that we release it. He, let's imagine what the ML game development loop might look like. Well, first of all, we would need to create the entirety of the game besides the AI agents, right? Because we need to make sure that the states are constant, right? The states aren't going to be changing. So the whole game besides the AI agents needs to be done. Okay, well, this is a chicken or the egg situation. Uh, yeah, uh, because we can't actually know what the whole game is going to look like until we know how the AI agents behave in it right? Until we know how the enemies or the friendly NPCs, until we know how they behave, we can't make the whole game. <laughs> There's just no way. But we can't train these AI agents until the whole game is created. So, okay. Well, let's pretend that wasn't a problem. Let's make the whole game. Now we're going to train our AI agents with deep reinforcement learning to play the game. Uh, again, let's pretend we had infinite compute for an infinite amount of time. So that wasn't a concern. Well, okay. Then once we've done that, we need to now play our game with our trained AI agents. And you know what? At this point, we're probably going to find, okay, the game actually needs tweaking. So now we need to go back and tweak the game. But now we need to train our AI agents all over again because our state representation has changed slightly. And so we need to train our AI agents with machine learning to play our game from scratch. If this is anything as complicated as Dota 2, we're now talking about two times the length of human civilization as a minimum in terms of our compute time. And then we have to do it again and again and again. Just no way to fit these things in there. They had the same thing happen with the, in Gears of War. They trained some AI enemy agents to play the game with deep reinforcement learning. They worked okay, but then they made a single change to the rest of the game and the agents all broke. Okay, so at this point, you might be feeling some things. You might be feeling depressed. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, there's all this super cool AI out there and games are just never going to see it. You might be thinking, oh my goodness, Google and OpenAI are just using these cool game examples in order to show off for the press, in order to attract more people to their companies because they seem like a cool place to do AI, even though if you go to the company, you're not likely to actually work on these particular projects. These are very small teams. You might be thinking, is there no hope for game AI to do cool, weird stuff? Well, let me introduce you to AI-based game design. Where the basic idea is, what if we went just absolutely buck wild with the AI? No rules, just right. Put whatever AI we want in the game. The major selling point of the game, the major thing we're designing around is the AI. This is largely theoretical, but there are some examples, and we'll be talking about them on Friday. And that leads us to question three. And I'm just going to leave it off here. No answers whatsoever, because we'll be talking about it on Friday. What I really want you to do is brainstorm. If we weren't hampered by resources or by time, what kind of game could you make that used your favorite AI approaches from this course? Give it some thought, write something down, and we'll talk about it on Friday. Talk to you then.